Chapter 29 Dis Ex Machina Yu Cho's inactivity was complete. There was no matching his composure during this period of crisis. His calmness, born only from the depths of loneliness, silenced the family. It was almost as if they had decided the anonymous letter was a hoax. That is how calm Yu Chi was. He passed those days serenely, not saying much. The youth planted his feet on his own ruins and with the self-possession of a tightrope walker perused the morning paper at leisure and took a nap when the sun was high. Before a day had passed, the family had lost the urge to resolve the issue and seemed bent only on how to get around the topic. Above all, it was not a refined thing to talk about. Missa Iskabroge's reply wire came. It said she was arriving in Tokyo on the Special Express Harto, arriving at 8.30. Yuchi went to Tokyo Station to meet her. Misa Iskabaragi, carrying a single small suitcase, got off the train and picked out the figure of Yuchi wearing a student cap and white shirt with sleeves rolled up. She saw his face with its non-committal smile, and, much sooner than his mother would have, observed his distress. Possibly she had never imagined seeing anything like this expression, concealing its burden of despair. She hurried toward him in her high-heeled shoes. Yu Chi too made his way swiftly toward her. His eyes still averted, he seized Nissa Iskabroge's bag. Her breathing quickened. The youth was conscious as ever of her steadfast gaze. It's been ages. What's wrong? Let's talk about it later. All right. Don't worry, now, I'm here. In truth, there was in the lady's eyes as she said this an unblinking, indomitable strength. Yu Chi needed this woman whom he had once so easily forced to her knees. Now in his helpless smile she read the hardship he had undergone. And as she realized that it was not of her making, a feeling of extraordinary courage was born in her. Where are you staying? Yu Chi asked. I wired the inn that was once our family mansion. The two went to that inn, and were greeted by startling circumstances. The well-intentioned manager had made up the second floor western room of the annex for Missa is Kabaragi, the very room in which she had discovered Yuchi and Kabaragi. The manager came to greet them. This old-fashioned, perspicacious gentleman did not forget to treat Missa is Kabaragi as if she was still a countess. Aware of the awkwardness of the relationship between him, as host, and her, as his guest, and embarrassed that in a sense he had usurped her residence while she was away, he praised his establishment as if it were her home and he the visitor. He slithered around the walls like a lizard. The furnishings were so marvelous that we took the liberty of keeping them just as they were. All our guests say that they have never seen such genuine, refined furniture. I apologize about the wallpaper. We had it changed. The gloss of this mahogany pillar, now, is inexpressibly beautiful in a subdued way. But remember that this was once the steward's house. Of course. I'm fully aware of that. Missa is Kabaragi offered no objection to being assigned this room. When the manager had gone she got up from her chair and walked attentively around the old-fashioned room, which looked so narrow because of the bed covered with white mosquito netting. Now once again after six months she was in this room into which she had peeped and then fled from home. It was not her nature to see this turn of events as an inauspicious coincidence. Besides, the wallpaper in the room had been rehung. It's hot. If you'd like to take a shower. At this suggestion Yuchi opened the door to the narrow book closet, about three mats in size, and turned on the light. All the books had been removed. A sheet of pure white tiles glared at him. The book closet had been turned into a moderate-sized bathroom. As a traveler returning to a land visited long ago discovers first only his old memories, Missa Iskabaragi was attracted only by Yuchi's unspoken anguish, the counterpart of her own pain. She did not see his transformation. He looked for all the world like a child in torment, incapable of doing anything about it. She did not know that he himself saw his distress. Yuchi went into the bathroom. There was a sound of water running. She reached her hand to her back, undid the row of small buttons and loosened her bodice. Her shoulders, smooth as ever, were half exposed. She didn't like electric fans, so didn't dot turn on the one in the room. 
but from her bag she took a silver leaf Kyoto fan. His unhappiness and the happiness I am returning to, what a heartless comparison, she thought. His emotions and my emotions are like the blossoms and the leaves of the cherry tree, made to come out without meeting one another. Moths were colliding with the window screens. She understood the stifling impatience of the great moths of the night scattering the dust from their wings. Anyway, this is the only way I can feel. At least now I can encourage him with my sense of being happy. Missa Iskabaragi looked at the Rococo sofa on which she had sat so often with her husband. Sat nothing more. Not even the edges of their clothing had touched. There had been always a fixed distance between them. Suddenly she recalled the memory of their grotesque shapes, her husband and Yuchi, embracing each other. Her bare shoulders felt cold. What she had seen was accidental. In fact, it had been an innocent intrusion. She had wanted to see the kind of happiness that existed eternally and surely at times when she was not present. Such audacious wishes always invite the most unfortunate results, perhaps. And now Missa Iskabaragi was with Yuchi in this same room. She was occupying the very place that happiness might have occupied. Instead, here she was. Her truly sagacious spirit soon awakened to the evident truth that for her there was no possibility for happiness, and that Yuchi would never love a woman. Suddenly, as if she were cold, she reached back her hand and refastened her bodice. She had come to realize that all her charms would be futile. In the old days, if so much as one button were undone, it was because she was conscious of the presence of a man who would be glad to button it. If one of the men she was accustomed to associate with in that period had observed her modesty here, he would certainly have doubted his eyes. Yuchi came out of the bathroom combing his hair. His damp and glistening youthful face reminded Missa Iskabaragi of the coffee shop where she had seen Kyoko, when Yuchi's face was wet from the sudden rain. In order to set herself free from memories, she called out to him, All right, tell me quickly. Here you've brought me all the way to Tokyo and you haven't yet told me why. Yuchi gave her the gist of what had happened and asked for help. However, what she caught running through it all was the urgent hope that the authenticity of that letter somehow be disproved. Misa Iskabaragi therefore quickly made a daring resolution. She promised to visit the Minami home the next day. Then she sent Yuchi on his way. She was somewhat intrigued by it all. Her character owed its uniqueness to the fact that in it an inherently aristocratic heart and a harsh heart were naturally combined. The next morning at ten o'clock the Minami family greeted an unexpected visitor. She was conducted to the second floor drawing room. Yuchi's mother appeared. Misa Iskabaragi said she would like to see Yasuko too. As if acceding to the visitor's request to be spared an encounter, Yuchi remained in his study. A somewhat fuller body in a light purple dress, Missa Iskabaragi had a style that swept all before her. She smiled constantly, so polite and composed that even before she began her story she had filled Missa Isman army with terror, making her fear she was to hear about yet another scandal. I hate to mention it, but electric fans and I- Oh, thank you, said the guest, and a hand fan was brought. She held the handle of the fan and languidly waved it and let her gaze flutter about Yasuko's face. This was the first time the two women had sat face to face since the dance the previous year. Normally, Missa Iskabaragi thought, I would be jealous of this woman. Her heart, however, had become fierce, and, perhaps out of cruelty, she felt nothing more than contempt for the beautiful young wife. Yachin wired me and asked me to come. Last night I found out all about that strange letter. That's why I've come here today. I understand the letter also had something to say about Mr. Kabragi. The widow Minami hung her head in silence. Yasuko lifted her hitherto downcast eyes and looked straight at Misa Iskabaragi. Then she said, in a soft but firm voice to her mother-in-law, I think I'd better not stay. Her mother-in-law, not wishing to be left alone, stopped her. But Misa Iskabaragi has gone out of her way to come here to talk to both of us. Yes, but I don't want to be part of any more discussions on the subject of that letter. That's just the way I feel. But when you don't discuss the things you should, you regret it later on. 
The way in which these two women went on exchanging very proper words and at the same time walked circumspectly around one ugly word was ironical in the extreme. Missa is Kabaragi interrupted for the first time. Why, Yasuko? Yasuko felt as if she and Missa is Kabaragi were engaged in a clash of wills. Well, I just don't have any thoughts now about the subject of this letter. Missa is Kabaragi bit her lip at this curt reply. She thought, my, she takes me for an enemy and is challenging me to a fight. Her patience was at an end. She cut short her efforts to help Yasuko's narrow, young, virtuous mind to see that she also was on Yuchi's side. She forgot the limitations of her role and dropped all inhibitions about making high-handed statements. I really want you to hear what I have to say. What I have come to report is an auspicious thing of a sort. Some who hear it, however, may look at it as an evil thing, perhaps. Please, hurry and tell us, said Yuchi's mother. I'm in an agony of suspense. Yasuko did not leave her place. Yuchin felt that, besides me, there was no witness who could say that that letter was absolutely without foundation. So he wired me to come. What I have to confess is a bit pill to swallow. I think, however, that what I have to say will do much to put your minds at ease about that disgraceful lie of letter. Missa Iskabroji's voice broke as she went on, Yajin and I have been having an affair for a long time. Missa Ismanami exchanged a long look with her daughter-in-law. This new blow took everything out of her. After a time she regained her composure and asked, but does Asta risk that mean recently, too? You've been in Kyoto since spring. When my husband lost his job, he was already suspicious of what was going on between me and Yuchi. So he made me go to Kyoto with him. Just the same, I've been coming to Tokyo all the time. And Yuchi. The mother fumbled for words but finally fastened on the vague word, friendly, and somehow managed to say it, and Yuchi was friendly with only you. Well, Misa is Kabaragi looked over at Yasuko as she replied, there might have been other women. He's young, after all. That can't be helped. Yuchi's mother's face went beet red, then she nervously asked, those other people, weren't any of them men? My... Laughed Missa is Kabaragi. She took pleasure in letting the vulgar words fall from her lips, but I know of two women who have had abortions to get rid of Yuchi's children. Missa is Kabaragi's confession, candid and bare of superfluous flourishes, had a tremendous effect. This brazen confession delivered before the wife and mother of her lover was far more appropriate and credible in the situation than a maudlin confession meant to elicit tears. The widow Minami's confusion was more than she could bear. For the first time in her life her feminine modesty had been attacked there in that vulgar restaurant. As a result her will was paralyzed, so that she could see in this most recent extraordinary event which had been provoked by Missa is Ragi only its naturalness. The widow tried to calm herself. It was a respite to allow stubborn, fixed ideas to run through her head. Nobody can prove that this confession is a lie. The best proof of its truth is that regardless of how men might act it is impossible for a woman to confess that she has been involved in an affair that never took place. Besides, when it comes to a woman rescuing a man, there is no telling how far she might go. So it is possible that a woman like the former countess would march in on a man's mother and wife and make such an ill-bred admission. There was in this judgment a marvelous logical contradiction. In short, by her use of the word man and the word woman, she was already taking a mutual affair for granted. If she had been an old-fashioned woman, she would have closed her eyes to an affair like this, involving a married woman and a married man, and covered her ears too. But now she found herself approving of Missa Iskabraj's confession. She was thrown into terrible confusion because her moral outlook seemed to have become cloudy. She was frightened by the part of herself that leaned toward believing Missa Iskabroji's entire story and rejecting the letter as a piece of rubbish, and felt a strong urge to cling to the evidence she had gathered verifying the letter. Yes, but I saw his picture. I still feel sick when I recall that filthy place and that ill-bred waiter with Yuchi's photograph. Yuchin told me about that. Truthfully, 
He told me that some of his school friends went in for that sort of thing, and they pestered him so to give them pictures of him that he let them have two or three, and I suppose they got passed around. Yuchin went to some of those places with his friends, half out of curiosity, and when he gave the cold shoulder to a man who kept making passes at him, that man wrote the letter to get back at him. Well, why didn't Yuchi tell me, his own mother, that story? I suppose he was afraid to. I'm not a very good mother, that's certain. Granting what you say, however, may I ask you an impolite question? Is there no basis for believing there was anything between Yuchi and Mr. Kibaragi? She had been anticipating this question. Nevertheless, she had to struggle to maintain her composure. She had seen it. And what she had seen was not a photograph. Misa is Kabaragi was wounded in spite of herself. She was not embarrassed about bearing false witness, but she found it painful to betray that fervent pretense she had built over her life since she beheld that sight the very fervor from which this effort to bear false witness sprang. She was acting heroically now, but she refused to see herself as a heroine. Oh, that's a story beyond imagination. Yasuko had been silent the whole time. The fact that she had not said a word made Misa Iskaba Ragi uncomfortable. In truth, the one to respond most honestly in the affair was Yasuko. Misa Iskabaraji's veracity did not seem open to question. But what was the watertight connection between her husband and this other woman? Yasuko bided her time until the conversation between her mother-in-law and Misa Iskaba Ragi was finished. In the meantime she was groping for a question that might perplex Misa Iskabaragi. There's something I find strange. Yuckin's wardrobe has been steadily growing. Oh, that, Misa Iskabaragi answered. That's nothing. I had them made for him. If you like, I'll bring the tailors over. I'm working, and I like to do things like that for someone I like. Really, you're working? The widow Minami's eyes rounded. It was unthinkable that this woman, the soul of extravagance, should actually be working. Misa Iskabaragi informed her straightforwardly. After I got to Kyoto, I became a broker of imported automobiles. Recently I struck out for myself as an independent broker. This was her only true statement. Lately, she was showing great skill in a commercial arrangement under which she bought cars at 1,300,000 yen and sold them at 1,500,000 yen. Yasuko was concerned about the baby and left her seat. Yuchi's mother, who until this time had been putting up a brave front for her daughter-in-law's benefit, broke down. She could not determine whether this woman before her was friend or foe. Regardless, she felt compelled to say. I don't know what to do. I'm more concerned about Yasuko than about myself. Misa Iskabaragi launched forth coldly and bluntly, I came here today determined about one thing. It seemed to me better to have you and Yasuko know the truth than to be menaced by that letter. Yuchi and I are going on a trip for two or three days. There is nothing serious between me and Yuchi, so Yasuko doesn't have a thing to worry about. Misa Isman Army dropped her head at the explicitness of this audacious distinction. At any rate, Misa Iskabaraj's dignity was hard to impugn. The widow abandoned her motherly prerogatives. The intuition by which she divined in Misa Iskabaraj more motherliness than in herself was a correct one. She did not realize that her comment was ridiculous, please take good care of Yuchi. Yasuko bent over the sleeping Keiko. In the past several days her peace had been shattered, but like a mother who in an earthquake instinctively protects her child's body with her own, she had constantly schemed how to prevent the catastrophe from affecting her child. Yasuko had lost her bearings. She was like a lone island buffeted by rough seas, no longer fit for human habitation. She was being propelled toward something enormous, more complicated than disgrace, she felt almost no humiliation. The pain that almost took her breath away had come well after the incident of the letter, when the equilibrium she had attained by determining not to believe the contents of the letter was destroyed. While she was listening to Missa Iskabaraj's frank testimony, a transformation in her innermost feelings indubitably came about. 
of that transformation, she herself was not yet aware. Yasuko heard the voices of her mother-in-law and their guest as they came down the stairs. Thinking that Misa Iskabaragi was leaving, Yasuko got up to say goodbye. But she wasn't leaving. Yasuko heard her mother-in-law's voice and had a glimpse of Misa Iskabaragi's back through the blind as she was conducted into Yucha's study. She walks around my house as if it were her own, thought Yasuko. Misa Ismanami soon came out of Yucha's study, alone. She sat down at Yasuko's side. Her face was not pale. On the contrary, excitement had brought a flush to her cheeks. After a time the mother-in-law said, What moved her to come here and tell us a thing like that? She didn't do it for the fun of it, that's certain. She must like Yuchi a great deal. To say the least. Now in the old lady's heart, apart from her sympathy for her daughter-in-law, a kind of relief and pride was being born. If it came to the stage of deciding whether she should believe the letter or Missa Iskabaraj's story, she would unhesitatingly choose the latter. That her beautiful son should be sought after by the opposite sex was in her moral outlook a virtue. In short, it made her happy. Yasuko realized that she and her kind mother-in-law lived in different worlds. She had to take care of herself. There was no other way. From her experience, however, she knew already that, other than letting matters take their course, she had no way of rescuing herself from pain. Placed in such a pitiful position, she crouched and moving, fixed, like a helpless little animal. Well, that's the end, said the old lady in despair. It's not really the end, mother, said Yasuko. Her words were stem, but her mother-in-law understood them as being meant to give her courage. In tears, she thanked her with whatever phrases she could utter, I'm such a lucky person to have a daughter-in-law like you. Thank you, thank you, Yasuko. When Misa Iskabaragi was at last alone with Yuchi in his study, she breathed the air of the room deeply through her nostrils, like one entering a forest. This air seemed to her more delicious and refreshing than the air of any forest. This is a nice study. It was my father's. When I am in the house I can only breathe easy when I'm here. I too. Yuchi understood why her echoing phrase came so naturally. She had barged into somebody else's house like a strong wind, thrown propriety, honor, sympathy, and modesty in all directions, indulged herself to her heart's content in cruelty to herself and others, and fervently, for Yuchi's sake, dared superhuman feats. And now she took a breath. The window was open. On the table was an old-fashioned desk lamp, some ink bottles, a heap of dictionaries, and a Munich beer stein decorated with summer flowers. Across the near foreground, so like a copper plate etching, the scene of the fierce, late summer street unfurled itself, somehow imparting a desolate feeling by the raw wood of the many buildings raised on the ashes of the fires. The capital street cars descended the hill on the trolley street. After a passing cloud slipped away, the rails in both directions, the foundation stones of the burnt ruins still not rebuilt, and the shards of glass in rubbish piles shone out with a terrific glare. All is well. Your mother, and Yasuko, too, aren't going to that restaurant again just to check up on you. All is well, I agree, said the youth, convinced. There won't be a second letter, I suppose. Mama doesn't have the courage to go there a second time, and Yasuko, even though she has the courage, would never do so. You're tired. I think you should take a little vacation somewhere. Without consulting you, I announced to your mother that you and I are going on a two- or three-day trip together. Yuchi turned to her as if shocked. Let's go tonight, she urged. I can get railroad tickets through a friend. I'll call you later. We can meet at the station. I'd like to stop off at Shima on the way back to Kyoto. We'll take a room in the hotel. She studied Yuchi's expression carefully. Don't worry. I know too much to cause you any trouble. Nothing will happen between us, so relax. Misa is Kabaragi again had gauged Yuchi's inclinations. Yuchi agreed to go. In fact... He had wanted for two or three days to extricate himself from this stifling situation. 
no companion could be as gentle and as safe as Missa is Kabaragi. The youth's eyes displayed his appreciation, and Missa is Kabaragi, who feared as much, hurriedly waved her hand, it isn't like you to be grateful to me for a small thing like that. All right. During the trip, if you think of me as anything else but air, I shall be very upset. Missa is Kabaragi departed. Yuchi's mother saw her to the door and afterward followed Yuchi back to his study. While she had been with Yasuko, her eyes had been opened to her role. The old lady closed the door dramatically behind her. Are you going on a trip with that married woman? Yes. I wish you wouldn't. It will be pretty hard on Yasuko. If so, why doesn't she come and stop me herself? You're a child. If you then simply faced Yasuko and told her outright you're going on a trip, you'd cut the ground from under her feet. I'd like to get away from Tokyo for a little bit. If so, go with Yasuko. If I went with Yasuko I would get no rest. The woman's voice rose in her excitement. Think of your child a little, too, please. Yuchi dropped his eyes and said nothing. In the end his mother spoke. Think of me a little, too. This egoism reminded Yuchi of his mother's complete lack of gentleness during the episode of the letter. The dutiful son was silent for a time. Then he said, Anyway, I'm going. I've caused that person enough trouble. What with their weird business of the letter? Don't you think it would be mean not to accept her invitation? You're talking like a kept lover. Right. As she says, I'm her kept lover. Yuchi pronounced his words triumphantly to his mother, now more distantly removed from him than he could measure. 